Going where the silence is. The Quo Podcast. A mainstream argument that seems to have reduced big tobacco's complicity is that, you know, this idea that smoking is a choice and people should be free to live their life as they choose, which... I mean, there's obviously a a real aspect of legitimacy to that, but it seems to be an argument which was extended upon by uh, Dr. Glover, who you mentioned before, uh, whose foundation is exclusively funded by Philip Morris, um, a Maori uh, researcher. And from my understanding, sort of part of her argument that you've touched upon is, you know, that any attempt to curl Indigenous um, smoking is sort of like an, an extension of, you know, white supremacy or colonial post-colonial control. Um, But I'm interested in, I guess, what you also touched upon, how this negative stigma around addiction plays into this. So, like, do you think that tobacco companies like Philip Morris benefit from the existing stigma around addiction because smokers are perceived as sort of like not strong enough to quit and it's not on Philip Morris for having introduced them and addicted them in the first place? Like, do you think that destigmatizing addiction could sort of affect the way tobacco companies are perceived. People yeah, well, de- definitely my friend, my ex-girlfriend, because I like I like introducing personal drama in all my stories. I base that on like I, I used to love early Eminem albums because you just be like listening to it and you're like somehow he's bringing up his ex-wife and he's, he's like what? But I always found that fascinating. So I really like it because it just seems like I don't know if inappropriate, but it just seems like funny that sort of like. I'm in a book and I'm researching cigarettes or whatever like that. And then it's like, oh, this woman. Oh, by the way, she's my ex-girlfriend or whatever. Anyway, unfortunately, her father, um, like whilst I was writing the book and I got this message from an ex-girlfriend I hadn't heard about, heard from for ages. And she's like, my dad, he's like, there's this tumor growing on his face and we've had to put him into palliative care. And then uh, three days later, I get a text from her. It's like, he's, like, he's dead. And there's going to be a memorial service or whatever like that. And so I write about that and go to the memorial service. And anyway, her take, the reason I give that back, her take was exactly what you're saying, where she says that, and I I think this can be like, including me, we don't understand this is if we don't smoke ourselves or whatever, that we don't understand the stigma that's, and the, the fact that we feel totally judged The people who smoke feel really judged and, they feel like people aren't on their side. They feel like that people are like saying, well, screw you. Like if you didn't want to smoke, you shouldn't have smoked, (laughs) you know? And um, so she makes your point that cigarette companies get to uh, sort of take part or leverage the feeling that uh, people addicted have that uh, addicted cigarettes have that, you know, well, Ultimately, it's their fault. And and so, therefore, you can't blame Philip Morris because a person can always choose not to smoke. And uh, my book kind of touches on this whole thing of how addiction, which is a physiological truth, so it's not like just some woolly thing of like, hey, man, people are addicted. It's like you can test out in animals that animals actually get, you know, addicted. So there's this real tension between you have free will not to smoke, except there's a physiological thing where, well, in, in a way you can't stop smoking because you're, because you're addicted. And there's, yeah, again, there's this real, there's real tension there. And, uh, and Philip Morris happily, uh, of course, uh, are happy to leverage that and, and sort of like, well, people have free choice. And that, that's in fact, Philip Morris, I, I don't cover this in the book, but I found out about it incidentally, like Philip Morris actually really liked when warning labels came on, packages you know in a manner because it's like mm-hmm. well hey you can't say we didn't tell you <laughs> and so yeah yeah there's the, the seemingly nothing philip morris can't leverage their advantage which i guess i have a begrudging respect for but and another thing you brought up is which i found interesting when i was researching this is because i kind of remember that philip morris used to always leverage things around freedom and uh per- liberty so it was like well you have a right to smoke because you have you have you know there should be freedom and if they start telling you that you can't smoke cigarettes the next thing they'll say well you can't eat burgers and you can't have your guns or whatever like that and it's a slippery slope or whatever that used to be their argument back 
where when I was younger or whatever. But now because the backdrop of the world has changed and it's all about being hectoring and moralizing about everything. Now they've totally changed their strategy. So Philip Morris, don't talk about personal liberty and free choice and you should be able to do what you want or whatever, even if it's dangerous to you because you have a right and, you know, do you really want the government in, interfering in, the, in your life? They've totally changed it in the kind of the era of like hectoring and woke and wagging your finger and being moral about everything. So now it's like our ICOS and our heat stick is hell, is a less risky alternative. We're here for your own good. And, and can you believe the government's not like, they don't, they hate you and they don't want you to be having this choice for your own good. And so, yeah, I, I was really struck by how they're not, they're not playing the personal Liberty card uh, in 2021, like they were back in the nineties and eighties. And before that, even yeah. in America, really, where it's like, you'd think that that argument would really run. Yeah, you'd think that would be so successful in America because everyone seems obsessed by, you know, maintaining their personal liberty. So it's interesting that they have to, you're saying that, you know, they're they're just highlighting this idea that, you know, they're promoting a healthier alternative as as that's what's going to be effective from a marketing perspective as opposed to um, the choice, which I think relates a little bit. Of, um, to vaping, which I kind of want to talk about a little bit in the in the yeah, I, I think I think it's even like confusing to me how because I I just can't believe it like because it just seems like such a cynical play, but uh, like everyone readjusting to the new world in twenty twenty one. So I mean, I haven't looked too much into this or whatever, but you, you you'll even find you know like like the National Rifle Association will will kind of like come up with some story of some black dude who wants his guns. And then the white people don't want him to have guns, the white liberals. So, that, that, so even they'll frame the National Rifle Association will frame their argument for guns through almost like modern Twitter woke politics. Like, mm. can you believe these racist, uh, <laughs> these racist left, white left wingers want to take the guns away from this black American? <laughs> and, and so, and so therefore, if you're against, guns and you want more gun policy you're racist against black people you know and so it's like that's uh so philip morris has just adjusted to that world just like the national rifle association has so yeah i mean it's crazy it's hilarious kind of in a way and, and it's really good news for storytellers like me who like <laughs> look at all the, the tensions and hypocrisies and strangeness and in in the world but yeah. anyway uh vaping yeah no well so I'm just the next question well it starts from in the book you kind of highlight how some drugs are deemed sort of good and others are dream are deemed bad like in the eyes of public health officials in Australia especially when it comes to you know this whole thing around vaping which is very contextual at the moment um like pharmaceuticals like nicotine replacement therapies are deemed good while nicotine vapes are deemed you know potentially very harmful and I interviewed um, harm minimization and e-cigarette advocate, Dr. Wodak, who you mentioned in your yeah. book as well. And he sort of argues that drugs associated with pleasure are more likely to be deemed bad by public health officials. Um, and they tend to support more of like a prohibition approach to drugs. Like I just was interested firstly, like, do you agree? Like, like, what do you think it is that determines what's deemed a, you know, good drug and, and what's deemed a, a bad drug? Yeah. Well, um, well, first of all, one of the real awesome things about my particular circumstance, cause I've done documentaries on television and I've written books and I've been on the radio and stuff and I'm always being a smart aleck and, and also <laughs> I'm a bit of a gonzo journalists and gone by gonzo that means like you get involved in things so rather than being like the national geographic voiceover guy of like and here in west africa we see the uh voodoo doctor and we see how the voodoo doctor is pay, pay, taking part in a voodoo ceremony where like, i'm not that i'm in the freaking voodoo ceremony and i want to be in it because it's so much more fun or whatever but part of the consequence of that like the happy consequence of that is i've just like done too many like con contentious things that's been captured on camera intentionally 
then broadcast publicly. So <laughs> there's a limit to how much, even on like a, a practical level or a, a logical level, I can be wagging my finger at anything. Like imagine if my book was like, hey guys, you've got to be really careful about what you put in your mouth or whatever. And people are going to be like, Hey, like some guy's going to be sitting at home on his couch and talking to his wife going, Hey, Marge, Hey, the guy we saw on TV who was drinking peyote in the Arizona desert to try to get high. He's giving us a little lecture on like personal health and what you should and shouldn't put in your mouth. And Oh, the guy got nailed to the a crucifix in the Philippines. He's talking to us how we've got to be careful how we treat our own bodies or whatever like that. So I've kind of like, but I reckon that's kind of good because it just means I have to come up with some other sort of like storytelling technique besides uh, finger wagging. But anyway, so I, I mean, this is just the complexity and how there's like, it's there's no neatness and it's hard to have neat endings or whatever. So like I do, I guess I could ultimately believe that like people should be able to do what they want to do or whatever like that. But then like the other side of that is people should be like fully informed and and also, like, it's kind of okay to d- discourage people to do things that are bad, even if you're like, you know, like if I, if my partner smoked or whatever, and I've had partners who smoked in the past, and it's like, well, I am going to try to like come up with some argument that they shouldn't smoke because I don't want them to die or whatever. But, you know, but on the other hand, it's like I'm going to let them do what they want or whatever. So it's all, it, all, all this stuff is kind of like messy and like lots of sort of, bows that aren't tied up neatly but um so so when it comes to harm minimization i guess there are people who know more than me and there are people who are saying that it's uh uh it's better for people who like if you have safe injecting rooms and uh because these people are going to take heroin anyway or it's good to have pill testing at festivals or at music festivals because people are going to take ecstasy anyway. So therefore an extension of that is that we should be trying to get people who are smoking cigarettes onto vaping because there's a way to vape that's going to be less harmful than a cigarette. And like, and the main way, which they do have an argument where it's like the, the main thing that kills you in a cigarette tar is absent from a vape. But then this is like where it gets like really super tricky or whatever. So there's two trickiness. One is like, yes, but are you, are you inhaling other stuff into your system that even though it's not tar is actually going to have respiratory problems that are, could be like really dire where it's like, it's like, oh, great. So the cancer you died of (laughs) wasn't the tar related cancer. It was like this other respiratory issue that's um that you died of in, in a vape or whatever but but i think i think like the real tricky thing with discussing vapes and whether it's harm minimization or not is that that if someone was addicted to cigarettes and then they spent like six months a year weaning themselves off cigarettes and lowering the nicotine rate in their vapes and then at the end of that six months or, or the year they put to one side both cigarettes and vaping then I think there is an argument, like, like, sorry, not I think there's an argument. People who are, have, have a good reputation, like the National Health Service and the British government, in, in the British government, they say that is a tool for harm minimization because you're getting people to gradually get off cigarettes and then they're parking to one side both the cigarettes and the vapes. But then the issue becomes that if you just huff on a vape for the next 10 years, <laughs> day in day out not all night and day like is that is that going to be healthier in that context of consuming a vape and i would say that's a pretty big roll of the dice like why why would it be not why would it not have really consequential health consequences to your respiratory system of inhaling these agents into your lungs and into your into your system that sort of like don't occur occur naturally in the air. And in fact, that's what one of the doctors um, told me. Um, I don't think it's in the book or whatever, but yeah, one of the doctors who was looking into vaping and the ICOS, that's exactly what he said. He said, it's like our lungs aren't meant to take things 
uh, so so your lungs can put up with things for a certain amount of time or your respiratory system can put up to it but after a while it's just it's just not meant to we're meant to breathe air we're meant to breathe fresh air we're not meant to be breathing propylene glycerol and uh yeah and so that's when it becomes like this really tricky argument about whether it's harm minimization or it mm. isn't if you are enjoying this podcast head to the and follow us on our socials using the handle at the quo au i've been grappling with this question because i'm doing a a podcast series on you know the social and public health impact of vaping i'm trying to be neutral and listening to sort of some of the harm minimization aspects and also you know public health officials and academics who have a much more hardline approach. And it seems like it, people aren't that great with sort of sitting in the uncertainty. Like there's a lot of evidence that yeah. it's got, you know, it does have bad health consequences now, but what we don't know is what 20, 30 years, like we didn't know about smoking for what 30, 40 years, the long-term health consequences so is that enough like i guess the harm minimization people are saying well anything that's likely to be slightly better than smoking um we should get these people on it you know it should be enough but we don't know that it's significantly better than smoking and yeah there are just so many different kind of things that i'm trying to grapple with because there's you know a social justice aspect that like you know smokers are tend to be from low ses um communities and marginalized groups and and they don't necessarily have access to kind of support services and if vapes help them then they should have access and vice versa yeah I'm just so confused. So yeah, it's helpful just chatting to someone who's also kind of like sitting in the uncertainty of it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think we're comfortable. Well, I myself am generally not that comfortable in just like sitting in the uncertainty of not knowing. We want to, we want a black and white thing. Like I was speaking to someone who goes into schools and they were saying like the easy thing with smoking is you can tell schools, you know, school kids smoking kills. But when it comes to vaping or these supposedly better alternatives we can't really tell them that strong a message. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like that's, you've really struck upon the case for uh, Gonzo storytellers there. <laughs> story Because I'm the opposite. I'm like running towards the complications. It's like, and if there's no complications, I'm assuming there is a complication. I just haven't un- undug yet. And I, and, but I think we, yeah, we have to like dig into the complications and because <laughs> because it's complicated there's no other choice there's there's not a reality the only way there's no complications in this is if we're either don't know or we're going to lie about it and so yeah we have to rest in the complications but i mean i mean and philip morris just totally fully exploit the complications like this heat stick that isn't a vape they imply or they they lead you to believe it is a vape when it's convenient to them so for instance when the national health service of the british government said e-cigarettes are a valid way to try to ease you off smoking and it's a healthy alternative to smoking right so philip morris were like we agree with the national health service and that we need to look to futures things and blah blah smoke-free future Whatever, and so if you're reading that, you're thinking Philip, Mor- uh, you're thinking the National Health Service have somehow endorsed or approved of Philip Morris's heat stick and ice icos, right? And but then I, I looked into the into what the National Health Service said, and they said, oh, by the way, when we say e-cigarette, we're referring to vaping, and we're absolutely not referring to uh, devices like Philip Morris's ICOS and heat stick. And so they, again, kind of like manipulating the language because you plug a vape into a wall. So therefore it's an e-cigarette because you plug this ICOS device into a wall. Therefore it's an e-cigarette. They, they totally take advantage of the fact that when the national health service in Britain says we're endorsing e-cigarettes, Philip Morris are like, Oh, you see, you see, you see they're endorsing e-cigarettes when really the National Health Service explicitly say they're not endorsing um, uh, the Philip Morris devices. And then, but in the opposite way, when there was uh, in America, there were all these bad news stories about kids dying from having black market vape juice. 
and ending up in hospital because of that. Then, then Philip Morris came out and we're like, they're doing the opposite. They're like, uh, listen, guys, I know you're hearing all these news stories about how people are dying because they're taking the, this black market vape juice. Can we point out that our heat stick and ICOS device is not a vape? It's the opposite of a vape. And, and the dude who um, uh, heads up Philip Morris, he even had the audacity to kind of go, listen, if you're feeling a bit nervous about vaping now because you're hearing all these news stories, like, um, Maybe I mean, we, have, we have this heat stick and this ICOS that isn't a vape. So they're, they're, they're nothing if not totally audacious. I really like, I like definitely if I was in a fight with someone, like I just think of all fights I've had with like friends and family members. I was like, man, I wish Philip Morris were on my side during those fights. Cause I would have just whispered into my ears, all the like the manipulative little screwing with other people's heads way of, 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 of winning arguments. Yeah. And talking about words, I really like the word audacious. Like I think it sums up Philip Morris pretty, pretty nicely. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks for chatting. I guess to to finish off, I just wanted to touch on like what do you want the impact of your book to be for readers? Like what do you want readers to sort of I know it's not you're not one for sort of like didactic messages, but maybe what are the questions yeah. that you want people to be grappling with? you know, in their own minds and, and yeah. Well, the, the way the book works, I think creatively is because I see the, the power of words and about how you really can reshape the world and reshape reality by redefining things. And by having this sort of like postmodern attitude of like, well, words don't matter and words can mean anything and definitions don't mean anything. And it's like, okay, fine. Maybe that's containable on a small scale level. But Philip Morris are totally taking advantage of this new world where words and definitions get to, everyone gets to define their own truth. I, I mean, the whole thing of this isn't a cigarette. I haven't really thought of, put it this way before. I thought about it this way. The whole thing of like Philip Morris holding up tobacco rolled in paper with a filter at one end that you plant between your lips, inhaling nicotine and tobacco into your lungs and saying, this isn't a cigarette. That is them doing the, well, what is truth? <laughs> I mean, what really, what, what is anything? It's sort of like, it's, it's like some annoying first year uni student um, to, uh, in a philosophy class asking, yes, but what is a chair? You say that's a chair, but what is a chair? And it's like them taking that thing that's already annoying when it's just a first year philosophy student at university and applying it to the most deadly company um, in the world. <laughs> and, you know, hey guys, but what is a cigarette? <laughs> so, um, so it's just being very wary of people who are trying to like reframe the world and redefine reality by Re, right by redefining words and by also putting forth this argument that like words and meanings don't matter and everyone's truth is somehow the truth so yeah th this is like that that kind of thought gone haywire so yeah, yeah be very careful about people or very or at the very least powerful people who, who are trying to screw with the dictionary and redefine what words mean and what they don't mean. And, and even though obviously there's a layer to like, there's evolution in linguistics, there's evolution in language and things, definitions do change and that's a good thing or whatever, right? It's like, okay, sure, that can, that, that can be true. But at the same time, if Philip Morris are playing that, that game, maybe it's, not, it, maybe it's not good in their case. And maybe we shouldn't um, let Philip Morris um, be able to ask, yes, but what is a cigarette in the way that we grant that luxury to a first year philosophy student at university? Mm, I resonate with lots of what you said. Yeah. It's, that, that's kind of you drawing the line there. It's like, you know, you can question a lot, but when it comes to are cigarettes doing you damage, the answer is yes. Like is Philip Morris killing a lot of people through smoking? Yes. Is the Icos a cigarette? I guess you're saying yes as well. Yes, so, yes, totally. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for chatting to me, John. It's been yeah, no, it's been really you. illuminating.